Bibliosophie. We we've been talking. Uh, we already we already said some extremely intelligent things. Um, I know, but, and it went all up unrecorded. Yeah, but that's okay. <laughs> you know, sometimes you can just chat with somebody who's cool about cool things. Truth, truth. Yeah. Was there anything in our discussion you would like to surface here, for the, the record? The TLDR version for the minutes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you were saying just now before your Zoom um, ran out of time that the act of reading Le Spectre is really, yeah, it's it's an act unto itself. And then upon rereading, something seeps in. And I really, really like uh, you likening it to yeah, going to like a place of worship. And it's just this ritualistic babble that kind of doesn't really... It just becomes like this hum in your life that you don't understand and then you actually have a deeper connection with. I don't know what that's like because I am staunchly atheist and have always been staunchly atheist. I did not grow up uh, with any sort of worship service. However, uh, I have imagination and empathy and I understand that that's how things happen. And that's exactly, yeah, that's exactly, I think, the the process of reading Le Spectre. Yeah. And I hope uh, then you can join us in the specterism. Join the cult. Um, but Worship it, them. it is very culty for that reason, partially. Uh, why, actually, why else do you think there is such a cult figurehead in Le Spectre? I think because she's unlike anyone else. I think when I first picked her up, I never heard of a voice like this ever. Yeah. And it felt so outside of the human realm that I was like this this person's a witch this person's a literal witch like how is she able to write about the self and jumping in the microcosms and macrocosms of the self and then like expunge it out and become this almost like outer body experience mm -hmm. and that's what reading the act of reading the specter feels like i feel like because it's like it's so you're so removed from it but there's this fluidity and when you get the grace of the fluidity it's then you you really do peek into it and you realize oh wait this is about me <laughs> this is about life and the world and how emotions run, how feelings run, how I'm accepting the world, how the world is accepting me. And it's within this like micro macro mm -hmm. cosms that exist that I think just makes it. But like within rereading the specter, you recently reread The Art of the Star. What was that second reading like in comparison to the first? So much better. Uh I read The Hour of the Star for the first time two years ago, I think. I'd only ever read her short fiction. Um, I got that big collection of her, all of her short stories the door a while ago. Uh, and I read, not, I have not read all of them. I don't know how many of them I've read, but over the course of several years, I've read a bunch of them. Um, and... She's, she was always somebody kind of like in the back of my brain as somebody I knew, I knew that like cool hot girls were really into. Uh, so I finally picked up Hour of the Star, thought it was thick and a little confusing and also okay. I'm probably more well-equipped to deal with obtuse books than a lot of people. I don't care that much. I read so much poetry also that I'm okay with living in that kind of amb ambiguous place that we were talking about earlier. Um, but I liked it sans plus, basically. However, this time around, I actually really liked it. Uh, it was a book that I found interesting and very less Victorian, basically, the first time. And this time, it actually, it moved me and I... Yeah, it, it really seeped in a lot more, I think, because I was able to recognize more of the things about her that I have since come to really like 
and love actually more than like. Uh, I reread Agua Viva also a, like two months ago. I read it for the first time in February and then I reread it like all in one afternoon. And that was magnificent to do because you get to just really let yourself go. Uh, yeah, you just release who you are. You were talking about realizing that the book is about you and just like how much she's speaking to what it means to be a human in the world. And yes, also, however, I might frame it completely the other way, which is that the book is not at all about you, doesn't give a fuck about you. And to go back to like the true neutrality that we're always, I think always, or at least almost always aiming for in Le Spectre, this like search for a biological existence, a cosmic existence that is unjudgmental and not good, not bad, just sort of neutral. I think par part of what makes the books really dig into you is it because they're like cats they are in, they're charismatic they are impossible to look away from they care about you they're warm they look at you but then also they're existing they're in their own lives there are so many ways in which they are not sharing your life and it's more than a cat who can actually feel affection for you. It's like the the ur cat who like just doesn't care. It just is there. And you just have to love it on its terms. Yeah. Um and that's ext that's extremely attractive too. That's off-putting, attractive, weird, um and very uh destabilizing which is also magnificent i we're constantly trying to we're constantly pretending like we're trying to be as stable as possible but actually the things that we love in life the most and the things that are so meaningful in our lives are the times when we are allowed when it's safe to be unstable and that's what's so wonderful about yeah just really the act of reading the specter and the act of reading other people who are able to just like that yeah <laughs> yeah there's a great mystery in the <laughs> <laughs> um i what i want to ask you is because you've read all of the novels not yet no i have one left oh okay good and that's besieged city yeah which i'm terrified of because i hear it's the hardest of her bunch and it's my last, and I don't want to end it. But it doesn't matter. There's no end. The That's end true. Is, That's true. It's the end of your first or second reading of some of these, and you get to just read them over and over and over again. They can, they can handle it. Yeah, yeah. So, they, all of them can handle it. Yeah. <laughs> For lifetimes upon lifetimes. It's fine. But yeah, but I, I think it's it's sort of like uh, the the newness bit. It's like I, I realize that they're there will be no further connections. There isn't like a, another book to connect all of them together unless there's one that's hidden somewhere in the bunker. You know, Benjamin Mosier's closet of some sort. You know? <laughs> you know, it's just like hiding it from the rest of us. Because I bet you there is. There's like this one hidden novel that he has like... I, mean, I would not be shocked. <laughs> that, that, feel, that feels right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what... But what what's the entry point we've talked about this before actually in this very location uh earlier this year when we first met in person the beginning of the year essentially and now here we are at the end of the year full circle this is the specter in the work well yeah i mean this was my Le specter year um not you know it's not done but i i read a lot of Le specter this year and i asked you what what are the entry points? What are the the books that one should start with? We were talking about that, and I want I'm going to ask you again, and I'm also going to have some more opinions. I think we kind of agree on them, but yeah. What? Give me three answers potentially to what should be my first Lispector, or give me one, but I can never give one answer to anything. So right. Um, I want to say for the record, 
uh, when we weren't recording this, I said that Aquaviva was sort of her artist statement. Yes, and it was a great, it was a great statement on your end, a part, and I think it is worth reiterating for the record. Yes, and I feel like a great entry point into her work, given that it's essentially philosophy, the Spectre Philosophy One Hundred and One Crash Course. Uh, what did you say? It was um, all no plot, all vibes, but like a hundred fifty percent. I said so. I agree. I have, in fact, recommended it as a first book for a couple of people. Uh, I currently don't have my copy because I uh, lent it to somebody, um, and I told them I think this is a really good introduction because it's short. It's a very very short book. However. It could take you months to read because you might just get overwhelmed and upon embarking on this journey, you do have to be conscious that this is zero plot, all vibes. Oops, all vibes. Um, I think I said there was 150% vibes and yeah, I think it's the least plot heavy of all of the of her books, at least of the ones I've read. Um, yeah, because it really is just the inner workings of the foundations, it feels of where she writes from, what she believes in. And so it is sort of like an artist statement. But it's like hard to recommend an artist statement. (laughs) You have to know your audience that you're recommending to. If if the person seems like they'd be down, like they've read a lot of stuff that's avant-garde maybe, or um, they're comfortable with poetry, they're comfortable with, I don't know, like literary analysis even, or just, You have to, you have to know, not, you know, you're not going to be like, oh, hey, I heard that you really enjoyed the, um, you know, beautiful interpersonal relationships uh, set out by these authors. Want to try Agua Viva? No, they're going to be like, oh, I'm sorry. Why did you do this to me? Why did you like this? But it's also like, if if you do recommend it, it's like, hey, you just want to vibe. Yeah. Those are my people. Those are my people. Yeah. Um, so Agua Viva is a possibility. Any other? Any yes. Other? I do want to say, I also recommend Aqua Viva if you are an artist. I feel like if, if you're lost and um, you want to try out a new author and you just like need something, need some kind of sustenance for some sort of change or you know charge in your creative work, I feel like Aqua Viva is such a great starting place for her work i agree yeah yeah or like some big change in your life if you feel like you're moving through the seasons or um you know getting rid of old people and bringing new people into your life (laughs) it's it's great it's a great book i think it um transforms a lot of uh your feelings transforms and validates and oh i love that it's true it doesn't seek to transform them also i think it kind of accepts who you are because again it doesn't care um right. in doing so it might allow for metamorphosis yeah yeah but then yeah when you when people ask for a recommendation i think they are looking for vibes a balance of vibes and plot <laughs> which is a hard thing to do because i feel like most of the specter books that they, they don't have they the, the plot is thin very very thin so i say go all out and do passion according to GH. That's that is my recommendation. Uh, that I think is the best equilibrium of there is a plot. And actually, there's a very easily there's the most uh, easily uh, resumed. Can you say that in English? And does that mean that same way? No, it doesn't mean the same thing in English. Sorry. Um, uh, synopsized. What's the word in English? When you make a small like version a of summary, yes, thank summarize. You. <laughs> I was like, I don't know exactly where you're going. <laughs> you know, when you make a small Language. version of something. Um, <laughs> yes, I think it's like the only plot that is summarizable. Really, woman <laughs> finds cockroach. Cockroach dead. Woman has crisis yeah i mean you could say that in one sentence but it's great. three sentences is good too <laughs> well it was supposed supposed to be arty 
a woman consider a woman without much inner life reconsiders her entire approach to the world at the death of a cockroach. Beautiful, beautiful, done. That's a that's a good read summary. Love that. But yeah, that's it. That's the entire plot. <laughs> that is. That's really. We're not kidding you, dear dear reader, dear viewer. We are not exaggerating. That is the entire plot. Yeah, and if you do look at like the Goodreads reviews of this book, a lot of people are like, "That's it." <laughs> They're like, "That's the book." And I people like, have no idea. No, well, I referenced uh, a uh, summary. Wow, I referenced a uh, a story graph review in a previous video that I found absolutely magnificent. And it was indeed a uh, woman finds dead cockroach, woman kills cockroach, um, finds the void, realizes she's God. Uh, and it's like, yeah, absolutely. Perfect. That's t-shirt. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. Yeah. But also I feel like that's the specter, I feel at her boast, uh, boast. At her best, at in her terms of like at her best, <laughs> um, in terms of like balance between, yeah. yeah, plot and the very essence of Lispector. But then that's why I said I think that's why I said that like, I think I did. I think I said the hour of the star is like a good place to start. It's an interesting one in that I think there it, is plot. There is a, there's more plot. It's you know it's, um, yeah. So that that's your third potential candidate for where to start. No. No? No? I don't okay. know. I don't know. It's it's I think as an insider, I think it's a good third recommendation within the cult. Yeah. Sure. Speaking from cult status. So it's for the reading. If if for I've read I'm total novice. I just heard about this woman named Clarice Lispector because uh this this cool YouTuber named Nathan's Nook is really talking about her a lot. And um, yeah, I, I just read, read, <laughs> I just read. We can't speak today, what's going on? <laughs> uh, it's Clarice. Um, we, I just read Passion According to GH. My next book could be Hour of the Star. Yeah, either. Hour of the Star or The Apprenticeship or The mm. Book of Pleasure. Sure. Because that's that's essentially the specter doing romance. Yeah. Well, and that, that's what we're all here for, right? A bit of romance. We love a love story. Near to the Wild Heart has romance. It does. Between different kinds of men, too. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, I, I, I uh, yeah. I'll say that. I definitely will say my first two wrecks are, are strong. Third one, I think, yeah. I'll say our star. Yeah, I agree with you. Also, you don't, you didn't have to have three. I, I think I would say for basically anybody who's going to be, you know, willing to embark upon a kind of specific journey, GH, maybe Agua Viva, especially because it's super short. Um, what is one that you should not start with? Oh God, any of the big ones. <laughs> like the chandelier? Like the, um, yeah, the chandelier is, it's, it's too much. It's good. It's a very interesting what she explores between siblingship, because it's sort of the first of the bunch where it's like, oh, she's looking at like familial relationships because everything else is sort of just man and woman and sort of the romance that occurs between them but here she really looks at like siblingship and it's it's precious it's rare mm -hmm. a bit sick and twisted and uh, i won't i won't spoil but it's uh, very interesting um apple in the dark which was recently what is that about i i i know absolutely zero about apple in the dark i was going to ask you i don't know anything about it I don't think you should know anything about it, but it's essentially um, man runs outside of Plato's cave and understands himself. Okay. Great. That's it. Love it. Yeah. So it's like a Spectre book. Cool, cool, cool. 
yeah <laughs> but um yeah apple and dark i would not um the chandelier i would not but then again like the hour of the star i i would not like it's yeah it like that should not be your first absolutely not your first because it's it's an odd one it's an odd one and you really have to be enveloped in the respect world or be aware of it at least and then tackle that I think is what makes it uh, a richer reading experience of the work. Have you done any of the big ones? Uh, by big, do you mean like they're long? Yeah. <laughs> but also like big brain. Um, they're all big brain, but like. Yeah. Uh, I consider all everything from Passion According to GH on big in terms of important and famous and certainly big brained. Well, all of them, yeah. Uh, there are shorter, though. I know the chandelier is longer because I have it on my bedside. I have no yeah. idea. Uh, and I haven't read it. Um, it's also in that Penguin edition where, like, the pages are, like, they're, like, biblical. You know? Like, very thin. Like, one ply. Oh, I have... I think the one I have is also New Directions. It's the one that's oh, the okay. pink with the... It doesn't even oh, have the pink, the yes. It, it's I the... And then it has a chandelier yeah um, yeah that's good that's good um but yeah I, I think uh you also did a breath of life yeah so my my controversial opinion is that it's still my favorite uh even having read gh i think gh is certainly a better entry point i think it's like the quote better book breath of life is per it's just perfect for me it's like just one of my very favorite books um and it i lent it to a friend and that was his first lispector which i think is not a good entry point i think it's a kind of deranged entry point but yeah i was gonna ask like how was his experience oh with that? he adored it he fell in love with lispector but again he was coming from like liking obtuse things and being completely unable to read novels because he can't handle plot so it was perfect um, yeah yeah, and then he read Passion According to G.H. right after that. And loved Did he love that it. more? No. I, th well, I don't know, actually. I don't remember. I think he just loved them all. Okay. Uh, so it can be a positive entry point. If you, if you know, you need to cater. You need to cater your Lispector to your audience. I will say not all books are for all people, but Lispector is important. My field profile um, has absolutely nothing about me. I have no words. However, it has a couple of photos of me, including one of me reading um, I, maybe Agua Viva. I can't remember, but some Lispector. And that's like basically the only information you have about me from my profile is that I have cute blonde hair and that I read Lispector. So that's, that's hot. That's, that's hot. Broken up, honestly. I love that. I need to get more pictures of me reading. I don't know, like, <laughs> it's an odd thing to... <laughs> hey, can you take a picture of me reading? Just take it yourself, baby. Oh, that's true. I forget. I forget, like, you could, like, prop up your phone <laughs> and self-timer. Yeah. Welcome to my entire life. <laughs> um, yeah. Any yeah. other oh, um... things to say? This, you know, for for a channel for a channel video that what are what are some more thoughts that you want to say today we can have volume two at some point but oh yeah i mean god it's like that's the impossible thing i can do 30 minute videos on a singular like the spectra book and it's it's terrible <laughs> it's like like even a breath of life that just opens up a can of worms about like creator creation but also her, that being her last book, so it's a lot of musings on life and death. And you did mention like, um, like having no shame and stuff um, about the, like your hinge profile. It's like, the Spectre also has no shame. Yeah. There's there's, the, there's no embarrassment around sort of the way that we exist. And she realizes that like, you can't be. It's like, it's just one, it's part of the lived experience, but two, there's, so many bigger greater things happening within the cosmos but also 
the bios that's like it's just a natural way of being and there's this unabashed live livingness mm -hmm. wanting to live that's fighting that it, it pushes shame out of the way it almost squashes it but it is also embraced mm -hmm. i think well in the way that you're incredibly insular within the text and the way she writes um from the eye mm -hmm. i think it's always mentioned in her book but it's this the singular eye what is the eye and the exploration of that mm -hmm. um, which i also find so beautiful because i feel like most books don't don't really cover shame mm -hmm. um, no. or are so much so open about it oh it's just this gorgeous way to look for something in the world right and she is doing so there's urge and urgency and yeah it blots out shame because there is as we said neutrality and there is just so much of both an urge towards living and an urgency for it that it allows for everything including shame to be present but there's no you know plants don't have time for shame and neither does she and i think that's very empowering to read and I, that's partially what makes it creatively inspiring because there's so much shame in attempting to create and create self so it's because it's so caught up in the eye as you said it's extremely self-conscious but i think it's unashamed and that's a really fine thread to needle to throw oh, i don't know there's an expression it's a it's a very fine line to walk that's an idiom so yeah really beautifully said about shame yeah okay two things before i forget i'll ask them but like um why is a breath of life your favorite and then two um to piggyback off what we're talking about um does she write for herself? Does she write to save herself? In an interview, the Penguin one, I think, where they translated um, the only like video footage of her interview, she she talks about how writing doesn't save. It's just a thing that she does. But I don't know. A part of it is like I think I think she's saving something of herself, either for not necessarily legacy, but this something that like either died within her. Or to upkeep some kind of living, breathing thing that, again, I think um, what you said has this urge and urgency, this wantingness to be alive and to live. I'm going to refer back to the beginning of Hour of the Star. And I, well, actually, I could maybe quote directly if I find uh, the passage quickly enough. But the very first part of Hour of the Star is, um, I think the world began with a yes. As long as I have questions, I will write, uh, is also on that first page. And I think that encompasses everything gorgeously. Yeah. En ce monde, tout a commencé par un oui. In this world, everything started with a yes. And then two, and yes, I, I know I just said it in French, sorry. Um, and two paragraphs later, as long as I will have questions to ask, uh as long as i will have no reply no answer i will continue to write and so i think writing doesn't save it just makes she writes like she breathes and that's partially what a breath of life well exactly and that's why i like a breath of life the most because i think it is the it's not perfect distillation because it's actually kind of a messy distillation, but it's the most sublimated distillation of the premise of to to be is to make it is to make yourself in every moment in every day and playing with when you make another. You are making yourself and when you are making a world you are making yourself and you are mining your experience you you are being made constantly and you are making constantly and to have a a consciousness is both to experience to take in the world passively and actively and in ways that you just cannot control and then actually try to 
make something of it. And in fact, I, so currently I'm reading uh, Seduced by Story about narrative, the Peter Brooks. And so I've been thinking about narrative. And what I really love about Le Spectre is that making is not making into a narrative. It is making into this sort of coil that is ever, ever more internal and the deeper you go into the core of yourself, the more you're actually connected to the entire universe. And Breath of Life to me is by its premise of author creates character, watches her die. And then the and Le Spectre herself as an author dies before it's even published. It is just the perfect encapsulation of the exercise of writing to live. So that's why. That's a beautiful note. I'm done. Thanks for coming to our TED talk. <laughs> I'm in tears. No, but yes, yes, yes. It's one, she was also writing in pain. Yeah, I think at the beginning of um, the translator note or the foreword, but she's in pain. She uh, suffered uh, major burn, I think smoking cigarette in bed. And, really? Um, yeah. I forgot and she burned, or I and, didn't read this, but. But yeah, she, like, she, was, she, she had a painful death. And um, in these last moments, these last pages of this book, she was really using writing as a way of breathing as a way of speaking as a way of you know there's this beautiful notion that she makes clear there's an absence or the space before language leaves the mouth and that's the very act that she acts on within this last book yeah and um yeah she dies before the book is even published and it's it really is like the work to me, it's just like perfect. And look, I'm a singer also, right? Uh, it's so fundamental to me. I'm so obsessed. I'm so obsessed with communication. And the concept of myself is really made by communication, a pretext for communication, a signifier prior to communication. What am I minus communication? Because of course I still am. Uh, so that it just feeds into the every obsession I've ever had without knowing it um, since I came to my own life. Yeah, so. I think um, at the beginning of our talk, before it was recorded, um, I had asked you if uh, Liz Spector understood herself. Mm -hmm. And it's through these books that do sort of say the same thing. Do you think that she knows what she's saying. Does she know who she is? She exists in, within the yes and the no. Yeah. I... But then you just reminded me of the, the hour of the star quote. Um, the world begins with a yes. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, so yes, obviously there is part of the answer has to be yes. And I think part of the answer is no. And I think we have to deal with it. That's all, folks. That's it. Yeah. You gotta deal with it. <laughs> yeah, you gotta deal with it. All right, I'm gonna close out the video with a little solo coda. Thank you so much for joining me, Nathan. I think it was most appropriate to close out my reading uh, journey so far of Le Spectre with you since I more or less started with you at the beginning of the year. Now, the year isn't over yet, of course. We are only in November, uh, so I don't know. And I certainly have plenty of novels of hers that I have not read. I would love to reread some more of her novels. But the good news is, not only is the year not over, but my life isn't over and I can continue to read her. I have really, really enjoyed this reading project. I think it has been a great success. I obviously have really fallen in love with this author. I encourage you to read her. Let me know. Let's talk Clarice. And yeah. Ciao.